Okay, let us go ahead and get ourselves started. Welcome back to session five, one twenty B two twenty B. Today we will continue talking about building layouts and kind of the core of the building stuff. So we kind of got cut off a little bit last time in terms of doing that. And I want to start pushing ahead into really just thinking about the building envelope. So all the different features of the envelope, those walls and windows and all the different performance things we want to achieve with them. Now we can do a little analysis to sort of figure out how well we're doing so we can uh, smartly place our doors and windows and really think about the materiality and make sure that's right for the energy performance we want and uh, it's all the, the right kind of building performance. Okay, as we get going today, we'll be a little bit different format today and then I'll just kind of keep on going straight through. We'll wrap up around three o'clock just because for the next today and on Thursday, um, there's like not enough rooms for you know classes to be going on, so just place classes to come in at three. So we'll finish up at three today, basically, and then we begin for today and for Thursday. Then we'll uh, return to our normal schedule like uh, next week. Um, in terms of important things coming up this week, this is the week where a lot of you will be meeting with us for the very first check-in. Okay, and for the first check-in, it actually um, it's kind of a non-threatening sort of thing, come on in just with your ideas and some initial sketches. Don't worry about being too complete in terms of what's going on, and we're just going to work through them together. Because many of you have signed up, some of you have not signed up. But how you do sign up for these check-ins is as follows. Over there in the Canvas world, you will actually find slots that are available to you. And we sort of post these, these should be showing up. In fact, what I could even do here is go over to scheduler, say, let's go ahead and send a message to students who haven't signed up yet. Okay, and like, uh, please sign up for a slot this week. Thanks. Okay, so you get a message, there'll be a link in there, and then you can go ahead and sign up for a time to get together with us. And the idea is you'll be meeting with me and Angad and Alana and just really kind of starting to walk through and talk through and I just gave you some initial feedback on your ideas for the projects. So please just do that at your convenience. We got several times available. If none of the times are working for you, let me know. And then I'll sort of, we can talk about your specific times. It's a little bit weird this week just because we lost Monday and you know, the whole week is off by a little bit. But we'll go ahead and adapt and sort of uh, add in some more times if we need to. Let's see if you can, okay? The other thing to think about doing for this week just relative to just progressing with the project is posting a first design journal entry. Okay, and I think so far, let me go ahead and go on out there. Oops. And then we have at least one out there. Let's see what else we got. The idea is again, okay, under the design journals now, you'll find under winter 20, oh, that's not the wrong class. Over here, you'll find under winter 2016 a slot for your design journals. So, what? We have just a few entries here. Oh, wow, it's a lot of stuff in here. Looks like Sing Chai's got his. Some design inspirations, as well as just some information. Looks like uh, you're putting in some things like, oh, like the table and stuff like that. Sing Chai, when you, when you put in that table, did you just uh, make a screenshot, uh, make a JPEG, put it in there? Yeah. Yeah, very good. Okay. No worries. Oh, great. Brittany's got hers in. Gustavo's got his in. That's my one from back there. Just go ahead put something out there and again it's just really helpful for us all to kind of share and don't worry if it's not too exhausted to get going with this is really enough to get us going in terms of talking about it, like uh, what the overall layout of the building is going to be like and thinking about just how to you know give you some feedback about how to proceed with the whole process so please go ahead and post something out there this is something we're going to keep on doing week after week so yeah put something out there now because you'll do some more a week from now like don't let them build up on you so, and take a look at what other people have done, be inspired. Actually, as I'm looking at this, I'm starting to understand all about these other buildings. Super, okay. 
when you do that, uh, you log in, you create it, whatever. There's some random stuff about getting going with that, but uh, if you're having troubles, let me know. I know that when you first log in, it'll give you some funky error message. That's a little bit of error in my programming. Ignore all that, and actually, I'll just demonstrate that just so you sort of see. So everyone sees it on the video. So even if I would go over here and I log in, It gives you that funny error message. That's just an error in my programming. Don't worry about that. What you need to do is just go on back over and say my journal entries. And then you can get to uh, the ones that are allocated with you. And if you've forgotten anything along the way, you can go through and just edit it, or unpublish it, or republish it, or whatever you want. And I'll just add some more text in here. Okay, when you get all done, the big things we try to do are go through and tag it. You want to make sure it is tagged to you. Actually, I tagged this unfortunately to Sangshai. Let me change that. So, uh, hmm, I don't have a place in here, do I? Well, who will I be today? I'll be Alana today. So I'll tag it as Alana and also tag it with our class. So a little, uh, is it control click? There you go. Now I have both of them. Selected. And all that is really, oh, maybe it's command. Let me try that. All that's doing is basically getting it so it's going to show up under the sorting scheme. So go through, set your stuff up, and ultimately say publish it and save it. Okay, and then you'll be out there. So again, go ahead and sign yourself up for a time to come visit with us, and then also go ahead and post something about where you are right now. Sort of make sense? You are laughing. Sign up. Was that? I can't figure out how to sign up. In, oh. For a time. Oh, that's interesting. Let's take a look. Actually, I've never done it from your side. So I'm going to just give you a link to this place. Please sign up for a slot. You can reply to this message. Okay. Go to the calendar. How about that? I just figured it out right now. Go to scheduler on the top right. And then, oh, you can sign up for this here. It's so funny, I've never done it from your perspective. So, okay, so look for where it says one available. Excellent. They've changed that interface a little bit on this too, so. Okay, we're learning. No worries. It's we're, we're self support. Because uh, it's kind of funny with all these web based systems and stuff like that, they change all the rules halfway through. Okay, any questions about what to submit this week or what to sign up for this week? Okay, good? Okay, beautiful. Let us go ahead then and shift our attention. I don't know, even let Alana explain this next side part. Um, in addition to just these designs, projects that you're going to carry through in great detail and lovingly handcraft all the way to the quarter. The idea is every week we're going to give you some little exercise that's just something that hopefully you'll spend no more than an hour on. And it's just something to exercise what we're dealing with like in the week. So the idea is some quickie little project, go ahead and put it together, yeah, submit it. Yeah, this time it's all about building layouts. So Miss Alana, can you come join us and tell us uh, what you have in mind? Okay, uh, yeah, so for the first exercise, it's just for building circulation and egress. Um, I just put three basic, basic buildings, um, shapes, and I just we just want you to put some doors on it, hallways, show where the hallways would go, put the core, um, stairs, and like maybe an elevator shaft, um, just showing your understanding of egress routes and where doors and hallways should be placed before you put them in your building so you can think kind of on a basic level before you commit to your design project. Okay, so where you're going to find these in Canvas is under weekly exercises. There's one called Building Lab. And there it's uh, Alana's instructions about what to do. Yeah. So spend some time, a little bit of time on it. There's a building file for you to download and get started with. And the idea is she'll say put the exits, the egress, the corridors, just kind of the basic layout. We'll talk about a lot of that in class today. But if you go on out there and open the file, let me kind of show you what it looks like. <coughs> da, 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 da. 
Well, there's a lot of flashing going on on my computer. Okay, so we have three basic buildings here. And those are the first floor layouts of those buildings. The idea is really just to go through and yeah, put in some basic corridors, sort of say where you put the stairway, where you put the exit, where you put the, uh, you know, the restrooms, things like that. Just kind of, just real quickly, sort of get some feedback about that. The idea is if you all submit them, we'll kind of like share them with each other. And you'll find out there's a lot of ways to uh, skin that building. So, you know, there's no single right answer to this, but it's really just an idea of, you know, having some fun and just, you know, trying to exercise over what we're talking about. So that it expands your thinking. Because with so much of the design project on you know, the center that you're working on, it's, you know, you get very focused and almost too tight in your thinking because you're trying to get everything balanced at once. So it's nice to sort of just play around a little bit on some sample buildings. Okay, so kind of makes sense? More or less? Okay, no worries. Again, it should be like, you know, if, if you're spending more than an hour, it's other than that, you, you're spending too long. It's, it's really just some quick ideas and stuff like that. So do it in Revit. If you want to, print them out and we'll sketch them. You, that's fine too, just whatever it is in terms of uh, doing it. But the idea would be that you come on in, say great. I'm going to put in some walls to represent the corridor. Let's see, I'm going to have a corridor going along this side here. Then what do I want? I might want to put a stairway at the end over there, so I'll go over and kind of create a staircase. Do something like this. Oh, big building. Just go ahead and start by putting some things in, just to give us a sense of how you'd lay out the building. Henry! Um, so in this exercise, is the first step to know a question for me. Um, where, is the first step like deciding, I mean, sometimes you can decide, sometimes it's dictated by the, the um, like the side constraints, the exit and the, the main exits. Yeah. Then, then you can skin your building or not? Or you yeah. Work yeah so, so part of this is really thinking about where you think of the main entrance as being. And for each of these, you know, we haven't given you much information on the site, so you can sort of imagine what you like. But in terms of this whole notion of, you know, oh, let's say we have this H shaped building here. You know, we could think about whether we want the entrance to be back here, kind of surrounded by a courtyard, or down here on the end of the building. Either one of those is kind of perfectly valid, so we haven't really given you much information. If you're thinking about it as, well, you kind of come into an inner courtyard the way a lot of the older buildings here on the quad work. Uh, we go to the door. I might put in some uh, doors right here as being the main entrance to the building, and that's kind of good. But then beyond that, you start thinking about there's these other entrances and exits which are just dictated by code requirements. You need to be able to get people out kind of quickly in the event of an emergency. So I might end up having, oh, you know, some doors at the ends of some hallways here. Yeah, I could have a door over there. But it's just to sort of think about where those are. But for our purposes, you can sort of imagine, uh, you know, whatever you want in terms of the site conditions around it. I'll put that door there at the end of the hallway. Okay, but it's really just kind of that simple in terms of starting to lay things out, figure out where the stairs are. These buildings are actually pretty large, so you have a lot of room in terms of working around, uh, like, uh, oh, to squeeze in hallways and restrooms and stuff like that. But we'll talk about a lot of the core features today. Okay, so let's go back. Okay. Let us dive into the bulk of what we want to talk about today, and that is starting with just this whole idea of like, you know, you have these different sort of notions of kind of circulation systems, egress systems, and how we go through and model those. We talked some about the concepts about how you have these paths where from any room you have to be able to get people out of, either out of the building or to a safe zone, where the safe zone might be a fire protected stairway within either 200 feet, if it's a non-sprinkled building. We'll sort of assume that generally our buildings are gonna be sprinkled, so then you have 250 feet. Okay, but somewhere from any room, the longest path to the safe zone has to be less than 250 feet. And there's a lot of rules beyond that, but at a high level, that's kind of one of the biggies. Other than that, in terms of doorways, thinking about that, the big ones we've sort of hit so far were if a room has less than 50 people as its occupancy, it could have a single door. If it has more than 50 people, up to quite a few, it's up to like 500, something like that, 
you got two doors. You know, if higher than that, you have like three doors. But there's no harm in having extra doors because uh, extra egress and extra safety is uh, certainly welcome. It's just these are the code minimums. Okay. In terms of how you model some of that stuff in a Revit, let's just kind of think about that. We talked a little about modeling and just how to create spaces last time. I want to think about just the specific stairs and these corridors and these vertical circulation elements. How do you sort of think about designing those things and really how you might go ahead and get started? So let's go ahead and do this. Okay, let me go back over to Revit, and we'll just go ahead and maybe even grab one of Alana's buildings. Because they're as good as any. What do I want to start with? I'll just go for the little L-shaped building. How about that as a starting point? So I got my little L-shaped building over here. It's not looking too bad. One of the first things you want to do is actually, in all cases, you want to set the project location. That will be so important in terms of the egress, but you also want to talk about the floor to floor height. And that will be important just in terms of stairs. We want to be able to model those accurately. So if I go to the elevation, for example, right now, and we take a look at our floor to floor height, what has she set up for us? Somewhere around 14 feet is A-OK. -okay. 14 feet, as people who've been in Global AC this weekend will tell you, is actually pretty generous in the scheme of things. It's enough room that we have room for the floor, we have room for some structure, as well as some HVAC stuff in there. Even if, uh, let's say, the structure took up, like say, two feet, and the HVAC took up two feet, even if four feet was lost there, you'd still have 10 feet clear before you'd actually put the ceiling, something like that. And that's pretty generous in the scheme of things. Often we don't have as much room to work with, and it becomes much more of a negotiation. But start with that. As we make these much taller floor-to-floor -floor heights, because we're trying to be generous that way, the cost of the building's increasing a little bit. But the other thing that's sort of increasing is uh, the stairway requirements. As you have these longer heights, it's going to take more and more room to go through and put your stairway in. Okay, so start by just getting those in. Let's go on back over here. Okay, as I think about, oh, this building right over here, yeah, I might want to go think about sort of where I would like some stairways. Okay, um, in terms of the stairways themselves, even before I place them, I can start actually just going through creating stairways that I can move around and drop into place. And you can think about stairways in a couple different ways. If you think about stairways as being 14 foot long straight runs, you can create something like that. In fact, it's not bad to sort of throw some of these out into the landscape and you can move them around as necessary. Okay, we'll have a width in there. Three feet is actually a little bit narrow for a commercial stairway. That's the minimum for a residential stairway. If you go checking out our stairs in this building, you'll find they're closer to, not 64, more about four foot six. Or you can make them five feet, something like that. We're gonna go from level one to level two. That's kind of okay as a starting point. Let me just sort of pull that straight on out. So there is a single leg stairway, just a single straight stairway. And I'll say, okay, that. I'm not going to worry about its railings and all that right now, just in terms of laying this out. Okay. Let's just kind of come up with some other shapes so you understand what else you have available to you. If you go through and you want to create a stairway and get to the second floor, we could create what I call a dog leg stairway or a two-legged stairway. Let's think about that. You could go ahead and as you drag out the stairs, notice this. As I'm pulling on out on the stairs, it's telling me how many I've created and how many are remaining. I know that for a seven inch riser height, it's gonna require 24 of them to achieve 14 feet, okay? So right now, 11 and 13, that's not quite half. If I pull it just a little further, I'll get to 12, super. Now I'm ready to put the rest of the stair. Now as I put the rest of the stair in, watch out for this. If you come right up close and try to drag along the edge, that won't actually be right, because what you're really drawing is the center line for the stairs. So watch out for that. If you get too close, it'll be pinchy. What you really want to do is give yourself enough breathing room so that there's room to create that little bit of a landing in there. So we can create a nice little L-shaped stairway. 
That's one to consider for ourselves. Let's go ahead and create another one. I just have fun creating different stereotypes. It's almost good just to do these kind of like building blocks and then like uh, sort of figure out which fits. If I want to create a dog leg stairway that one where it doubles back on itself, I might have 12 out and 12 going back in the opposite direction. Give myself a little bit of room. Okay, so that's a third variation. Any other variations you'd like to consider? Like, what do our stairways look like in this building? If you had to describe the topology of them, are they single straight runs? Are they L-shaped? How are the stairs in our building? Actually, they're all very consistent, which is kind of interesting. What, what shape do our stairs have? They're very close to that. They're not quite, though. Think carefully. It's interesting. Is there a hole in the middle of the stairs? They look actually something like this. I'll go for 24. I'll go up about 8. I'll go over about 8. I'll come down. Okay, almost all the building stairs in Y2E2 look like that. Now, there's a slight, you know, reason or a slight advantage to doing something like this. See this guy over here that has these, oh, like 24 stairs going straight on down? The problem with the 24 stair staircase is that if you fall, you're going a long way down. So we tend not to like to go through and have that many stairs just continuously. That just sort of creates the potential for like a hazard. You'll do that in sort of more of a utility sort of context, but if there's a lot of people coming up and down, we tend not to do that. Instead, we'll do something like this. If I really want to have the straight stair, I'll come up, and I'll come up maybe about halfway, then I'll skip a little distance, and then I'll keep on going. And that little intermediate landing is just very helpful for kind of giving you a chance to catch your breath in case something's going wrong. Um, little L-shaped stairway, that sort of ends up having the landing in there. Same thing here. Very common type of stairway. That's probably the most common type of stairway you see hanging around in my commercial buildings is these little stairs that work like this. This sort of stair that we have here where it wraps around with a few different landings kind of creates like an opening in the middle. Okay, why do you, if you think, if you can sort of imagine being over there in our stairway, the stairway that we have uh, here in the blue atrium or in the red atrium or something like that, is there any advantage to having that hole in the center? If you're standing in the blue or the red staircase and you look straight up, what do you actually see? What's at the top of the staircase? Yeah, there's a skylight up there. So there is a small advantage to like doing something like this and that. If you have a skylight at the top of the stairs or something like that, you can actually light the entire staircase. Kind of just with a skylight, something like that. So it's kind of nice from that perspective. But we take any of these things, and these are all a bunch of stairs that are perfectly viable. Let's go out and take a look at them out there in 3D. Now, a very common thing that we often do with stairs is if we have this kind of stairway going from the first to the second level, is very often we'll repeat it from the second to third level. Okay, we'll put it right on top of each other. It kind of often spatially makes sense because everything lines up nicely. It's good from a fire egress standpoint is that once you're going down, you're, you're continuing to go down, so they kind of loop back on each other. So, Revit actually has the notion of stairs that do that built into it pretty well. So if, for example, I want to take this staircase, and right now it goes from level one to level two, and I want to have that same staircase go from level two to three, three to four, like that, all you have to do is actually choose the staircase, and it says multi-story top. So the top of a single level is level two. If you want to make it a multi-story staircase, you can just go ahead and change it right there. 
and then it'll just repeat the pattern. So I can say make it go up to level three, at which point it'll double back and put the other half on there. Same thing here. Here's this little guy. This is my little U-shaped staircase. If I do that, it'll create another leg of it up there. And that's kind of nice, because now if I move the first one around, the upper one's going to move around. If I reshape the first one, the upper one's going to shape. It's, it's all going to sort of work together. So having these kind of vertical shafts that have consistent stairways actually works to your advantage. Okay, so I put some stairs in there. You can sort of get a sense of how big the stairs are necessary for getting myself from the first to second floor. So now I can try putting them in this building. Okay, so if I was going to put a staircase down here at the end of the hall somewhere, how might you put it? Brittany, where would you put my stair? What would you advocate? I might do the L one. Okay, we'll do my little L shaped one. So I'm going to go ahead and grab that. Let me see if I can get it. Super. And where do you want to put the corner of the L? You want to go from the upper left hand corner, the right hand corner, or how do you want it oriented? Um, okay, up in that corner there? Beautiful. Okay. So what I'll do is I'll do a little move action. Kind of put it inside the walls over there. Super. Okay. So in this kind of scenario now, let's think about it as you come up to the stairs, go up the stairs, come off the top of the stairs. You know, we have a little space at the end now where we're almost starting to say there's like a landing area. There's a little bit of an open area up there. Because if we're arranging our different rooms, you know, we have to be able to kind of get to the bottom. We have to be able to sort of like, you know, get off the top of it too. Okay. If this stairway were needing to be enclosed, if it was actually part of our fired scheme and we actually need to enclose it, how would you think about actually enclosing that? Can you, can you put some walls around it that would make sense? Okay. This kind of stairway works really well in an open kind of context. Because it's really, yeah, it's, it sort of works well in the corner that way. Okay, if you had to put some walls around it to sort of contain it from a fire standpoint, how would you do that? It, oh, that's a very good question. That's actually a very good question. Okay, you could do it as an L. Okay, the question was, could we do it as a box, or do we have to? Can we do it as an L, or do we have to do it as a box? Let me kind of come up with a smaller sort of wall. I sort of want stair walls that do this, and I could actually bring those right up in if I want to. But in terms of enclosing the stairway, let's just think about a couple things. We have to go through, and in terms of enclosing the stairway, we have to give you room to land at the bottom of the stairs. So when you come to the bottom of the stair, you can't just hit the door. You have to have a little bit of a landing area. So we'll need to put that in there. Okay, and actually, it has to be a minimum of, it's either three feet, or the way the code sometimes is written is, it has to be at least as wide as the staircase. Okay, at the top, Again, something similar could go on there. We could go through and put a wall in at the top on the second floor. Now that I said this though, I think the problem with this is that you can't get from the landing to the next set of going up at the stairs the same. It's kind of tricky because you'd have to sort of go outside Out the stairway <laughs> and come back in there. So the truth is we don't tend to use that as much. Or if we do do something like that, we'll do yeah, kind of what you're sort of been proposed originally, which is, and let me just trim those together. We'll sort of end up making this whole kind of corner shaft in there or something like that. Now, that's not to say that's all bad. Stairway is actually kind of a cool thing. In fact, in a lot of cases, you'll find if you have a corner stairway like this, um, we'll actually put a little glass around it. Not glass on the inside, per se, because on the inside, we need to keep the fire separation. But if this is fire separated, we can actually put glass on the outside. We can put some nice curtain walls in there or something like that. So in a lot of buildings you walk up to now, the stairways are actually visible from the outside with a lot of glass enclosing them. And that way, they're all kind of naturally lit. So we could do something like that. I could do like, oh, let me modify this. Modify it over there. Go ahead and change that so it's a nice uh, curtain wall of some type.
Little curtain wall storefront back over here. Little curtain wall storefront. Let's see what's going on over there. I might have to move my walls a little bit. We'll see how this is looking. Out of there? Yeah, it is there. It's, okay. it's just kind of looking a little funny right now. Kind of spin that around. Not too bad. It's kind of a little bit of a statement stairway. In fact, you know, since we have this big old stairway kind of hanging around here, we could even kind of open up the floor and have a nice atrium in there to kind of connect it all and make this whole kind of entrance, you know, staircase lobby thing. So we have sort of rooms coming up. That's a perfectly valid approach for doing something like this. But what I want to sort of reinforce today is just, just creating these little Revit components helps you understand just, you know, gee, that stairway took up a lot more space than I thought it was going to take up. Similarly, let's go ahead and kind of drop another stairway in here. Let's try, oh, putting this stairway in. I'll put this one, oh, how about, I'm just gonna put him right about here in the middle of the building. So same sort of rules are gonna apply about needing to enclose it with some sort of boundary walls and all that kind of good stuff. So again, I'm gonna come over here and say, let's go ahead and grab some walls. Can't just go to this point, we have to go out further. So what we'll often have in this sort of case is a hallway that we exit to. Super. We'll put a doorway so you can get into this fantastic stairway. Now, this stairway is not nearly as dramatic as the other one. This one might be more of what I'll call like a utility stairway. Something like that, or is it a fire egress stairway? Okay, let's think about the door direction for just a second. Always think about the direction of exit travel. So, it's going to be a little strange. On the upper floors, when you go to the hallway and you get to that stairway, you want to open into the stairway. So you especially want to make sure there's enough room in here. So if you go swinging that door open real fast in an emergency, you don't go crushing someone on the other side. So you have to leave a little extra room in there. Okay. Down here at the bottom, though, it's going to depend on when you get to the bottom, if you're exiting out here, then that would be an outside door. But I probably wouldn't take you back into the building. What I might actually do is at the bottom, just bring you back over to a door that's going out directly that way. So once you're in that safe exit path, you can get all the way out without having to get in there. So again, we'll put a door in. We'll put it over here. And that's going to be an out swinging door. Because again, you got to think about those 50 people behind you are all pushing and shoving. And you don't want to have to pull the door backwards because you, know, you might get crushed up against it. Okay, so a little bit of thinking about stairs, but always be thinking about the critical things are you oh, have to sort of allow room for the stair, at least that three feet, probably closer to four or five feet. You have to go ahead and kind of put these sort of walls that are adjacent to it, and then you have to allow room for the landings. The landings are important. You have to allow that, uh, you can't just open this door right into the stair. You have to have a little room on one or the other. Okay. So stairs, we'll go ahead and play around. If I put a stair here, I put a stair there. I am almost betting that somehow we'll need some sort of stairway over here, just because oh, if I were over here in the building and the obstruction was right here and I couldn't get to these stairways, I want to be able to exit to the right just as well to the left. As you're thinking about stairways, don't forget about this possibility, because it's actually one that we use very successfully here at Y2E2. There's a nice looking stairway here. In Y2E2, and as well on the Wong Center, they did this, which is actually kind of a very nice effect. They take the stair, they surround it with some curtain wall, like this.
But the stairs in Y2E2 actually are exterior to the building, or at least some of them are. The ones at the end of Y2E2 and the ones at end of Wong are actually hanging around outside the building. And that's okay too. So you have something like that, that is fine. We'll go through and put some nice double doors on that. Put some fire doors in here. Actually, we'll open this way, since you have to get out to the stairway. Okay. And then down here at the bottom of that kind of glass shaft, we'll have some doors that go outside too. Okay, so a lot of ways you can do this. Don't think about your, scare, your stairs have to sort of constrain you or have to be too incredibly tight. more like my little uh, glass stairway out there. Pop that up. I'll just take that up to level two, just because, or level three. Put a roof on it, and it's going to actually look pretty good. Okay, so stairs. Now we have to sort of think about stairs. Some other things I want you to think about, though, relative to cores are like elevators. Think about elevator for a second, then we'll think about some of these other utility spaces. Okay, how big is an elevator? Let's start with that. Any ideas? How, how big do you think an elevator is? Like, how, how big is the elevator down by the green atrium or the elevator by the red atrium? Any ideas? Is that six by eight? That's probably pretty close to what it is. That's actually a very reasonable size. Elevators tend not to be very huge, unless they're big utility elevators and you need to move in some heavy duty industrial like a uh, piece of equipment. You know, if you had an elevator that was trying to move things up to an exhibition floor in a, in a museum, that might be rather large, because you might need to sort of kind of encompass something in it. But for passengers, elevators tend to actually be, you know, fairly small in terms of what's going on. The way you model elevators in Revit looks something like this. Let's kind of think about even where I want to put an elevator. Okay, I have, oh, let me think about this. Let's say I'm gonna use this building, I'm gonna put some doors in here up front. Let's kind of create some sort of lobby space right over here. Something, and this is my lobby. Gonna put some stairs over there, that's looking pretty good. I think I might try to go through and put some elevators kind of over here next to the stairway. That's a very common place to stash elevators. Sort of right off the lobby near the stairway. Things like that. So let's think about these. Okay, the elevator car itself is actually pretty small. And if you actually wanna see some examples, oh, out there in the, uh, I think it was session three, we put some components out there that you can load in there. Let me load in some of them. If I go out to session three. Hang on, let's go up and out there. What do I have? Elevator and escalator families. You'll find some nice elevators hanging out there. Some electric ones, some hydraulic ones. We'll talk about those. Yeah. Generally, hydraulic elevators are very good for kind of um, when you don't have much space and you don't have to travel very far. So two to three stories, hydraulic elevators are very common. Electric elevators tend to be much quicker, okay, but they also tend to require a room at the top where you put pulleys and a motor and some things which actually take up a lot of space. So in smaller buildings, it'll often be hydraulic versus electric. In either case, it'll work. Let's do our little hydraulic elevator. You'll see I have some specific ones from the Schindler Company, as well as some generic ones. But if you go ahead and grab one of those, I'm gonna grab one of those hydraulic elevators. See what I have here in terms of the distinction between them all. We'll upgrade it. Under what folder is it? Oh, it's under, under under session three, and then I think it was elevator. Let's see if I can find it for you. It's like yeah, something like elevator and escalator families. Let me go on out there. Oh, yep. Got it. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. 
Looks like it's still doing a little upgrading. The deal about elevators in Revit is there's an elevator car component, but the whole idea of the shaft and the walls, there's really nothing uh, inherent or nearly as systematic as the way it works for the stairways. So we sort of build them up in little pieces. That finish upgrading. I should upgrade all my parts to 2016. <coughs> okay, finally, at long last, finish refreshing. I'm just going to upload the, uh, the standard one. I'm not sure why it didn't load for me, but I won't waste your time by kind of just watching me fuss with Revit. So, let's pop back out the session three. Elevator and escalator families. Let me just go for the hydraulic elevator they have over there. This is a much simpler part. Oh, some of the families you selected cannot be, you must choose families of the category doors. Oh wait, am I in the door category? Well, that's kind of dumb. Let me go to components. And now I'll load a family. Should we go back to component? Did I actually get it in there? No, that's still the desk, okay. Again, I'll go to, it's considered a component, place a component. Load the family. Session three. Okay, here is my little elevator car. You'll see that it's actually not all that big. Kind of bring it on over here. As you look, you'll see that it has a couple of different things to it. It's got basically some doors on the front of it. It's got sort of like a side rail for sliding up and down. It's like a person for a control rail over there. But we're going to place it. This component's actually pretty dumb. It'll just sort of place wherever you want it to. If I wanted to place this over here in the lobby, what I can do is rotate that. To rotate this as I'm placing it, there's all these little Revit tricks. If you hit the space bar, it'll rotate the object around. So if I want to have it face with the doors to the left, I can. So I can think about one there. I can think about one here, a couple little elevators in there. Maybe two elevators in my building. Super. As I go through now and think about enclosing the elevator, I have to put in some walls. Uh, I'll come up with some oh, two hour walls around it. Okay, and very often what will happen is we'll separate between the two different elevators. Not necessarily, but it just kind of depends. Okay, so that'll actually model the elevators. We'll leave a little kind of spare space around them. In terms of actually thinking about modeling it completely in terms of what's going on, the elevator car is a small piece of it, so if you want to get the car in there, that's kind of okay. Let me zoom on in there. What you can do is, if you want to align that car so that it blinds with a wall over here, you just use the align command to pull that wall, or that line, to the wall. So I'll say align. I'll grab the back wall and just pull that in. Again, I'll align and pull that over to it. Super. 
couple things we need to do to kind of complete our little model of that, though. The one thing we need to do is think about floor, which is currently separating us. Although we put the walls in here, we put the elevated car, there's no shaft. And shaft is really its own separate Revit object. If you'd like to put a shaft in there that'll open all the way from the floor up to the roof so you can have that elevator run that full distance. This would actually work for stairs, too. It's good to put a shaft in for the stairs. We'll say shaft. And I can pick the walls. And I'm going to trim that up. I basically have a shaft that will run from some distance. In my case, I'm running from level 1, minus 1, up to an unconnected 20. If I want to run that up to the roof, I'll just make it up to level 3. But the nice thing about shafts and why you like to start using shafts is when you have things that vertically align, they're smart about cutting out floors, ceilings, roofs, anything in the way. So they're a very smart object in that uh, you know, they have this behavior which is exactly what you want. It'll just cut out that floor so that elevator car can move right up through it. So we're pretty good on our elevator. Okay. Are you noticing anything that's missing from an elevator? We got an elevator car, we got a shaft for it to ride around in. What do we got here? I'll slide that over a little bit closer. Okay, Mr. Gustavo, you want to get onto that elevator. What's missing? Button. What's that? Well, the button, the push button, that, that would be good, but that's not it. That's, that's also missing. Anyone else? The door, we need a door to get in there. Okay, so, no worries. We'll go out there and go, this is actually a door object, I'm pretty sure. I'm always bad about what objects or categories things live in. Load, I'll go back out there to that session three folder. The button would be very nice, Henry, honestly. <laughs> that would be good. Okay, uh, the doors come as a separate family. So let's, we can have a center opening door, a side opening door. Got kind of two doors that go to the side. I'm gonna go just a center opening door. So what am I? I mean, I think it's probably a component, and I'm trying to load it as a door. So again, I'll go to component, load the family. It's really, I, that's one of those things that I think is, it, it bugs me about Revit. It's, you know, it knows what I'm doing wrong. It knows how to fix what I'm doing, but it doesn't. So let's go back over here. Let's grab those doors, which are actually components. go through and put some doors in here. Looks like in this case I have it on the wrong side. I'll put it on that side. Because usually those doors recess in. Okay, and then we can adjust the width so they actually match the elevator width, whether it's 36 inches or whatever it is. Okay, now you got a good looking doorway. Now, an important thing or a good thing about elevators that uh, kind of works to your advantage is elevators tend to sort of line up from floor to floor just fine. Yeah, they, that's, that's a good thing. They should, otherwise it's going to make them very hard for them to operate. So if we have this elevator, which we've modeled on level one, it's going up to level two, a very nice thing is you can take that elevator and just copy it from level one up to level two, paste it in the same place, and that way it'll all be perfectly aligned. You have to worry about realigning it. I can copy, paste it aligned to level two or three. And the nice thing now is yeah, that elevator's hanging around on the second floor too. So yeah, good thing about elevators, you know, they do line up from, uh, vertically and uh, it's easy for you to model in that way. That makes them very easy to model. Okay. So we're doing pretty good. We got some exits to our building. We have some doorways. We have some stairs. There's really only other few, th few other things that tend to live kind of in what I call the core of the building. And it has to do with just the fact that there's often this kind of strong vertical relationship between these. Um, 
one thing that we tend to sort of put in the core of the building, and if I'm putting the elevators over here, I might think about this area behind here being the core of the building. We tend to think about restrooms, and we also tend to think about mechanical rooms. And again, the reason we like to think about them in the core is well, if these have a strong vertical relationship. Is often stairs nearby that have a vertical relationship, aligning the restrooms, aligning the mechanical spaces floor to floor, make it much easier because very often the equipment is stacked on top of each other and you need to have things connect vertically between the two different levels. So for example, in restrooms, we tend to like to have the water lines that are supplying it connect vertically. We also like to have the drain lines. It's very important they do connect because for the sanitary sewer connections, it all has to go straight down or has to go down in a very kind of easy path. So let's just think about our restrooms. Restrooms are sort of another really good and interesting issue. Okay, we've got our vertical circulation. The question is for restrooms, how many do you need? And also, uh, how big should they be? So let's think about the how many first. Okay, what determines how many restrooms you actually need in a building? Number of people. Yeah, it's all gets down to the number of people. So everything we did in terms of calculating the number of people in the spaces comes up with some number of people. Then we get to there's all sorts of uh, hewing theory about basically how many servers you can provide for them and how long you want to have people wait. Because there's some level of satisfaction. The same thing actually happens with elevators. How many elevators are in a building? It's really no hard and fast rule. It depends on how much you want to make people wait around outside of an elevator car for a level of service that you want to provide in your building. Same thing with the restrooms. We could have one toilet per floor, okay, which just would be a very long, uncomfortable wait for a lot of people. So, you could put in you know, 100, which might be overly costly, but no one would ever wait. So there's some balance between how many you want. And this is an example, like okay, the Y2E2 building is actually a rather, rather big building. Any sense of how many people work in this building? And I don't know the answer, so uh, your guess is as good as mine. How many people do you think work in the building? You never thought about that, did you, Alana? What would you guess? I'll go with 300. I bet it's probably close to 300, something like that. Or at least 100 per four. I think that's actually probably pretty close. Then we have all the students move in and out kind of constantly. Okay, how many restrooms are on, let's take the second floor example. How many, how many men's rooms are on the second floor? <laughs> Two. Okay, how many ladies rooms are on the second floor? Two. Two. Okay, how many servers, where a server is defined as either a toilet or a urinal, are in like the ladies rooms? Okay, so three per room. No. There's six? six? Yes. You got six toilets in that restroom? Yeah. Wow! <laughs> Henry, what's going on in the men's room upstairs? How many do we have? Uh, I have one for ADA. Yes? One regular. Yeah? And wow. we have three of the stuff you don't have. Yeah, three urinals in there. <laughs> so, oh, you, you got more service. Actually, there's sort of a funny thing. Women's rooms tend to be more luxurious than men's rooms. They used to be large, they had fainting couches, they had all this, <laughs> there's this thing about ladies' rooms. Okay, but, okay, so you sort of say that somewhere upstairs on the second floor for the 100 people who might be working there, there are essentially 10 servers for men and 12 servers for women. Okay, so it all just kind of comes down to this funny thing about how many people and how long you want to make people wait. Because it's just kind of uncomfortable standing there outside the stall, kind of tapping your watch, just waiting. No one wants that. So you sort of have that. We also have little unisex restrooms, although those aren't all that common. We have them down here by Koopa. We have some of them over, you know, they're often the ADA compliant ones or they're often in big public spaces. It's kind of funny. They're not the most efficient restrooms. Yeah, we put them often in uh, places where we couldn't put a big server or restaurant or a restroom with many servers. Uh, I'm sure many of you have had the experience where you're kind of, you're waiting for the restroom door by Koopa and you go pop it in that door and it's occupied, occupied, and you're like, damn. You know, like you, it's, there's, there's, there's nothing available for you right now. And so across the hall from here, <laughs> use the bathroom here. Exactly. So you go, you go to your other alternatives. Okay, but well, let's talk restrooms. Restrooms actually have some very simple rules to them. 
Okay. Um, I'll just draw this because I think it's actually easier just kind of draw the picture and we can go from there. Um, if you're thinking about, and this could apply to either a men's room or a women's room, let's say we were going to have a restroom that had like, uh, oh, let's say two toilets and two urinals, something like that. Okay, what the basic dimensions would be. Okay, there actually are some basic dimensions that they sort of get dictated by. Very often they tend to be sort of rectangular spaces. Square is not really necessarily the most efficient shape. Okay. And the layout, something like this. The biggest space you have to worry about in most restrooms is the ADA compliant, the handicap stall. Okay, and that stall is actually very large. It has to be at least five feet wide. Okay, and in terms of depth, it's somewhere around seven foot six, could be eight feet. It's quite large in terms of having the door open enough and providing the room that's necessary inside. The rules are quite, you know, make them quite large. So you'll often have a space that's something like this. It'll be about five feet wide okay, by somewhere around eight feet uh, in the other direction. Deep. Okay, super. In this sort of configuration, we'll have some sort of uh, toilet over here. It'll be mounted on the wall. There's all sorts of things about you know, uh, the handrail requirements and things like that. But it'll have a door. Typically, the door will open out, but it could also open in. Okay, and there's a lot of rules about that. Okay, next up, you have the adjacent stall, which is typically more just a standard bathroom stall. Okay, how wide are those things? They're pretty small. You are correct. They're actually typically around three feet wide. Okay, so we'll put a toilet over here. In terms of the depth, they tend to be actually pretty small too. They're smaller than you think. They're usually around like four and a half feet. They could be five feet. They actually tend to be very small. So if you're ever in there and you need to like get changed or uh, kind of do anything that takes space, they aren't all that accommodating. It's sort of a, it tends to be sort of squishy in there. They tend to be limited by just this whole notion of the door being able to open without hitting the toilet. Okay, so we put another one of these in here. Oh, I said I was gonna have two toilets. Great, we'll go ahead and do the men's variation as opposed to the women's variation. Urinals, they don't actually have to be three feet, but we tend to allow something like that. That's a good rule of thumb. So we have some sort of uh, urinal just up here on the wall. We have a urinal up here on the wall. That's kind of fine. You could just as easily sort of think about replacing those with toilets. Okay. So if we give those about three feet and about three feet, super. Okay. That's the space for the fixtures. Let's talk about the uh, sinks. For the sinks, we can do just kind of a couple of things. We can put sinks over here on the end. We can put them across. It kind of just depends on the specific layout. I'm going to put them over here for now. It's got sort of a really simple layout. Okay, if I have, oh, say four servers, how many sinks do I need? Two, three. Actually, it's good that you're all guessing because there isn't a right answer to it. It's really, it's more of a convenience thing. I should look up if there is a specific, I don't think there is a specific code required. It isn't four. I think in most of our restrooms, there's like three sinks across. It just sort of varies. It's kind of, again, a matter of whether people should be standing around waiting to wash their hands or not. It's sort of that. Let's say there were three or two, whatever it is. Again, if I allow somewhere around three feet for each of those, okay, it's a little bit less than that. Okay. One thing that's sort of critical in here is this dimension over here being about four foot six allows a clear space over on this side Okay, of three foot six. And actually, I think the real rule is 44 inches. You actually need to allow this space, I think it's 44 inches across in there, which is like kind of freewheeling space. You also need to sort of allow space in front of the uh, sinks so that if someone needs to wheel up to those, they can use that. Does that say 4.4 feet? I said no, like 44 inches. I'm pretty sure it's 44, it might be 42. I'm almost positive it's 44. I'll give you some handouts that have the specific stuff in it. But you add all this stuff up and you end up with, if you just want to plan on restrooms, oh, the whole notion that I could have three, six, 
12, 15. I could have 20 feet here. My eight feet is actually not that uncommon. So watch out for this. When people are first laying out buildings, I think one of the hardest things people do, one of the most common mistakes they'll do is they just won't allow enough room for the restrooms. Then you end up with these really weird, squishy, odd-shaped restrooms that don't really work. So if you were thinking about restrooms being somewhere around 8 by 20, and again, you could change the basic shape. If I had an opposite sex room on the opposite side, then it'd be like 8, you know, 16 by 20. Okay, that's just sort of roughly what you have to allow. So what does that mean over in Revit land? So if I were allowing some space for restrooms, let's go to some nice walls. Let's say if that was like eight feet six to allow some space in the wall. And how far did I go that way? Let's see. Eight foot six, move that down. About 17 feet. I'm a little shy right now. I might want to go ahead and pop that out a little further. Depending on, gets, I have a four server bath restroom, I could go with less. But it's quite common, like, you know, this would not be a bad restroom sort of arrangement. Something like this. I could sort of adjust things. I could pull the elevator back. I could do all sorts of different things in here. But, you know, it's kind of things like that that tend to be sensible in terms of really allowing some space for yourself. So for a big public restroom, it's going to be dimensioned something like that. On the other hand, like if you want to have a little unisex restroom, oh, for whatever reason, we're going to put a restroom down here on the other end, and it's more like a kind of single server one, that's going to be more on the scale of like five by eight or six by eight, something like that. They tend to be actually very small. And they have all their own separate rules, but if I wanted to put in some little unisex ones, I can come over here. What do I have away from the wall there? That's about 15 feet. That's way too much. So, well, actually, it sort of opens up a possibility. If it was about eight feet wide, yada, 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 by six, I made it like 16 or 17. I'll give myself some space to account for the wall thickness. And then I come back over here, and I make that, oh, closer to six feet. That's enough space for sort of two little unisex restrooms in there. That's not a very good layout for them, but that's sort of some space that's enough to allow for them. Okay. The last thing I'll think about just relative to the core to get you side started is the whole notion of the mechanical room. Let's talk about that. Mechanical rooms are sort of a funny sort of space because you don't actually tend to see the mechanical room too much. It's typically hidden from you, and you just sort of enjoy the benefits of what's going on with it. But there's often a room that is, oh, it's maybe 12 by 12. It just sort of varies, depending on how much equipment's in there. It doesn't have to be a huge space, but it's a space where any air handling equipment's going to be located. Very often, obviously, sort of water pumping or heating equipment is located in there. We tend to just sort of out consolidate a lot of that space so it's not in sort of a public space. It's in a kind of corridor somewhere or someplace where the general public doesn't get to, but it services the building. And as you think about your mechanical room, it's not necessarily a big room, but here's what I want to sort of give you some guidance about in terms of thinking about it. The efficiency of your system is often related to how far things are away from the mechanical room. So if you're putting air ducts in, the further you are, or the farther you are, I've learned to say properly, um, uh, you need to basically have the ducts get bigger and bigger the, 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 the more distance you're trying to accom or accommodate. So in this sort of space, if I went through and said, you know, okay, I'm gonna go through and put the mechanical room over here, Okay. That might seem sensible and that it's kind of out of the way of the lobby and stuff like that. But what it means is to 
get all the way down to this end of the building, I got a long, long road. And that may mean that the ductwork that needs to service that, or even if I have some drain pipes that are coming through, you know, it's a lot of distance, a lot of height they have to kind of change to accommodate the distance between where that is and where the uh, actual loads may be. So when you think about mechanical rooms, it's often common to think about putting them in very central places. Like spaces like that are actually a pretty good space for a mechanical room because then I can basically come back this way and come back that way and it'll be a fairly even distance on either side. So given this sort of information, as I start thinking about my cores and stuff like that and the mechanical rooms would be over here, I might rethink my strategy a little bit. As I put my elevators and my restrooms over here, and my mechanicals over here, it might actually make more sense for me to think about putting the elevators and the restrooms over on this side instead of over on that side. And why am I trying to do that? I'm just trying to come up with this notion that there's this space right here where all the mechanical stuff that's going to get concentrated and be fairly equidistant from either side. Okay, so. Yeah, there's no hard and fast rules, but as we go through and look at your buildings, what we're going to be looking at is the overall layout of the X and stuff like that. We'll think about really where those restrooms, elevators, stairs, where all that stuff is coming together. Okay, and just try to come up with the most sensible and efficient layout. Because once we get those down, you know, in the end, as you keep on redesigning your building, if it turns out that for the purpose of what you need, Oh, the building is just going to keep on radically changing. You know, maybe the facade starts doing very interesting things. You know, maybe it bulges out over there. Maybe something happens over here where there's a whole separate room kind of popping around over there. That's all okay, but if the core, if that core skeletal structure sort of makes sense, you know, things can kind of grow out around it and it won't really affect the impact of the building. So, you know, in the same way I'd say if we were building the bodies, start with building the skeleton and then we'll start building all the features on it. You know, it's, it's really this kind of chicken and egg, but it often makes sense to go ahead and think about the cores first. Okay, that's the national cores. Any questions to get you going on that? That's, that's kind of all I wanted to get going on there. Is just get you thinking about that stuff. So, sort of makes sense or you got an idea what to do with your core now? More or less. He's thinking, I can tell. <laughs> no worries. When we meet, we'll talk about your core and kind of where that all makes sense. Okay, let's go and erase that and we'll just shift our attention to another topic before we adjourn today. That is, I want to start thinking about the building envelope just a little bit. Because the building envelope, once you have the skeleton in place, is really the next important thing to really start thinking about. Think about it as the skin that really separates you from the outside, kind of keeps things enclosed. It provides a lot of different functions. It sort of uh, helps to contain the whole notion of where the heat and the comfort uh, conditioned areas versus the outside air. It also can shade us, uh, prevent that uh, sun from beating down on us and making us uncomfortable. But there's a lot of different parts we're going to play with in the envelope. There's the walls themselves, there's the windows, the roof area, those are all part of it. Another part of our envelope, we don't think about it very much as though with the ground surface. That's actually could be a very important surface to us, especially if we're going to start thinking about digging into the ground. But for each of these different parts, we have a lot of different choices. So as you start thinking about the walls of your building and you think about, oh, really what you want to have out there, you have a number of considerations. You have some things which are going to be dominated by your aesthetic considerations, the color, the texture, the materiality you want to have there. Some of it's going to be sort of dictated by the performance. And those things sort of tend to work together. As we go through and we specify materials for our wall surfaces, we think about them in terms of are they heavy or lightweight? Because that makes a difference in terms of the thermal performance. Sort of Heavy things that have a lot of thermal mass kind of hold and moderate the heating and cooling. Lighter weight materials kind of change very quickly in time. 
Um, we think about the durability of our materials, the sustainability, like when Alana was doing her center, the whole idea of working with some reco recycled copper siding was kind of a nod towards just reusing a material to uh, kind of bring in kind of a natural element and kind of really emphasize how we want to like, uh, not put anything to waste. So there's a lot of considerations that go into this. On the windows, we're going to find we have similar sorts of choices. We have the whole notion of, oh, we'll think about how our windows are arranged. You know, do we have entire curtain walls where like a big bank of windows is covering the entire wall? Or do we have more singular punched window openings? We'll think about, you know, for the windows themselves, you know, what kind of glazing they have, how many layers of glazing, is it single, double, triple, quadruple? And also, are there any sort of coatings that sort of give it special performance characteristics? So a lot of really cool coatings we put on the windows to actually sort of improve uh, their performance with the sun, to kind of cut down on the shading, kind of cut down on the solar heat gain from them. Okay. We also think about windows in terms of their shading features. So, you know, on the interior, we can put shades in by including shutters or rolling shades. In a lot of the Y2E2 rooms, there's a rolling shade that'll come down if it gets too hot and sunny in the afternoon. But we tend to also like to put exterior features like light shelves or fins or use the roof eaves to shade them. But we'll really look at how for all these different elements of the facade, we can really go through and get the right performance you want. You want it to have the right thermal performance. You want it to have the right aesthetic appearance. And you want it to have, oh, just to kind of like the, the right durability. You know, it's, it's sort of all these things kind of working together. Okay. Roofs work very, very similarly. Again, we can think about roofs from an aesthetic standpoint. Do we want it to have a copper roof or a standing seam metal roof like uh, the Y282 building has or a red tile roof, something like that? Um, we think about the texture. We can also think about whether we'd like to have a green roof, which is sort of not only an architectural decision, we're going to actually learn to think about it as a thermal decision too, though, because putting a green roof on there it does an awful lot in terms of adding thermal mass to your building, which then helps to uh, kind of moderate the heating and cooling. So it's like a big thermal battery you're putting on your roof. Okay. So a lot of things we can do, you'll hear in different classes about dark roofs versus light roofs, that based on the amount of light we're reflecting, Brighter colors will reflect more light, so we absorb less heat. Darker colors will absorb the heat. So again, depending upon what you want to do. If you're in a cold weather climate and you want to absorb heat, you might want a dark roof. If you're trying to cool things down, a lighter roof might be better. But we'll go through all those things. That's what we're going to spend like the next couple days doing. But I want to talk to you just a little about sort of uh, just how you can model some of those things in Revit and actually start performing a little bit of analysis on them. So let's go ahead and we're going to open up a really simple Revit model. It's almost like a similar little unit model. But we'll think about sort of where the thermal properties, the building or the window properties live, and also think about sort of daylighting and how that sort of factors into it. Okay, so if you can, go ahead and open up in, I believe it is session five in the files. You find a little example called daylighting analysis of RVT. Go ahead and pull that down. Another thing I'd like you to pull down, though, is something called, it's under software installs. It's called Autodesk Lighting Analysis.msi. And this is one where if you pull it on down to your machine and then run it, it'll install a plugin to Revit. So definitely put it on your own machines. If you're working here and you want to put it on the machine so you can work on it right here, it'll ask you at some point for a username and a password to install it. So that's where you need this. When it asks you for a username, go ahead and type in this. This is all in lowercase. Okay, and then for the password, And if you install it on your local machine, you'll have a kind of a cool piece of software to work with. So if you want to pull down Autodesk Lighting Analysis and start installing that on your machine, I'll go ahead and open up this little daylighting example file and just show you where we put in the thermal properties of the walls, of the windows, and some of the things that are already out there in the file. 
But if you can go ahead and download that, that'd be super. I highly recommend downloading that for uh, your own machines. So you have that to play with. Okay, so I'm going back out to Revit. And what will we do? We'll go ahead and open up under session five, my little daylighting analysis building. See, it has a little flat roof on it. For the most part, this little building just has oh, kind of, kind of flat rectangular walls. Nothing too special there. It has a curtain wall on the south side right now. Okay. And I often start with little buildings like this because as we're starting to try to understand these analysis tools and how they work, it's usually good to start with a, a unit building where you think you could understand and predict the behavior before you put it on your building because. You know, you want to understand what the tool is doing versus what your design is doing independently. So it's always best to start kind of very simple and see if you can get the tool to do what you expect on this building. And then we can move on. So if you come on out to the floor plan, you'll see, oh, it's a very simple little building. It's just got those walls, it's got a curtain wall on the front side. It's very simple. I've also put a room in the building. Okay, but we'll get to that in just a second. Okay, let's start with the walls themselves. Like these walls right now are just generic walls. Generic walls are okay to get started as we're starting to think about just our general form, but they don't really have any properties. They don't have any thermal properties and material properties. You typically want to change that. So if you go to the generic wall and you say edit the type, you'll see, for example, if you scroll on down, it doesn't have any thermal resistance to it. That's because it just doesn't have a material to it right now. If we want to start thinking about the thermal performance of our walls and varying that and kind of customizing that, what we do is go through and just choose different wall types. So for example, if I choose a wall over here and I say, oh, it's going to be like a insulated concrete masonry units, I can choose that type. That's like a concrete block wall that has some insulation in it. You'll see that this actually does have an R value. It currently has an R value of around 26. There's a thermal mass because that concrete masonry unit is pretty heavy. It's pretty massive. Okay, so we have an R value of 26. And where it's getting that and where Revit starts to have all this information stored is just with the materials. So if I open the structure of the wall and you see the layers of the material that are associated here. We have concrete masonry units, some rigid insulation. Looks like another concrete masonry unit. So we have some insulation between two. It's about three inches of insulation. The way it works is that the rigid insulation material has a certain amount of thermal resistance to it. And if we change that material around, for example, if I change it to be five inches instead of three, you'll see that the R value jumps up. So as in real physical science, these materials have a certain density, they have a certain thermal conductivity per inch, and if we change the inches, okay, it goes ahead and changes that conductivity or the resistance. Okay, and as we get playing around with this, we'll learn that if we go over to the materials, we can start adjusting those things. But for rigid insulation, it has some thermal properties. Looks like it's polystyrene expanded right now with the material that's being used. It has all sorts of specific heats and densities. This has a lot of properties to it. But the net effect of that is if I go ahead and make that only, oh, a half of an inch, okay, you'll see I lowered the thermal resistance quite a bit. If I go ahead and make that six inches, I raise the thermal resistance quite a bit. So as we're playing Revit and you're thinking about your walls, you'll think about what are the materials 
the exterior materials are going to be the ones that really have the biggest aesthetic impact, but there's going to be some core layers, air, and some sort of insulative materials, and that will determine really ultimately what the uh, you know, kind of thermal performance will be, and that will have a big impact on really how much energy you're going to use. So we'll get to that. Another sort of oh, wood air or, or assembly that works in a very similar way is the roofs. The roof right now is currently just generic. You'll find that generic doesn't have any thermal resistance. So if you leave it set to generic, it'll just sort of be a very, you know, a lot of heat will leak out through the roof. If you change it to something, oh, like the insulated wood rafters, that'll have a value to it. And if we edit the type, you can start to see that's very high in terms of the resistance of an R value of 57. So that's all the sort of depth in there. So as you get going, you know, start by just putting down generic walls, but as you start maturing and you're thinking about it, start thinking about really which are the lightweight walls, which are the heavyweight walls. And you could use different ones on different sides. What you might have on the north side of your building and your south side of the building might be very different. Okay. Similarly, this window assembly has some thermal properties. As we think about how the uh, energy is moving through the envelope, it's really moving through all the different surfaces, the roof, the walls, even the slab on grade. So we might have to put some insulation in that. But the windows are typically an area where there's a lot more loss of heat. So if we go through and let me edit the system panel type. You'll see right now it's a certain kind of glazing. It's called eighth inch Pilkington glazing. Pretty low performance as a window goes. Notice its R value is 0.85 or 0.84. So if you contrast that to the walls, which had a value of oh, 13 or 19 or something like that, yeah. this is about 20 times more conductive of heat. So if we think about the balance, we're going to lose about 20 times as much heat through these windows as we are through the walls. So what that tends to mean is that you might want to go to a higher uh, performance glazing. If I go to like double glazing or low E double glazing or something like that, you'll see you get a much better value. So if I choose to a low E double glazing, I'll have some good uh, solar properties as well as some good insulative properties. The thermal resistance is 2.7. So what is that? That's about three times as good as the standard window. Okay, so it's going to lose about three times less heat. Okay, um, then we can talk about the trade-off between whether it's worth it. Yeah. Overall, you're looking at for a balanced system. So, if you have the most insulative roof in the world and you have very leaky windows, it won't do you any good because all the heat will leak out the windows, or vice versa. It does no good to go through and have incredibly well insulated windows and very leaky walls. It's really, heat will leak out wherever you want it, to, or wherever, you know, is the weakest link in the chain. So uh, go ahead, and we'll be thinking about all those things. I just want to show you those to get started. But then, start thinking about this more aesthetically. Okay, so the issue I wanted to sort of just show you real quick today is the notion of daylighting and how that impacts the building. Because that starts to affect how you think about, oh, on the windows, where they're placed, uh, the depth of the building, uh, just how well daylight's able to penetrate into that building. And there's a really simple tool that's available to help you analyze that. It's the example of sort of one of these performance-based tools that make it actually pretty easy to use your building model to understand and predict the building performance. So if you've installed that lighting analysis plugin, did any of you install that? Excellent, see, did it work? It's installed? Okay, beautiful. So if you have this building open, here's what we needed to do to make this work. Okay, every room that we're going to analyze has to have has to be a room. It sort of works with some notion of room. So I put a room in this big area. Every room has to have a floor. Okay, so those are the biggies. It has to have a floor and it has to have rooms, stuff like that. Beyond that, if it has a ceiling, it's a good thing just because it'll shade things. But uh, a roof. But it, those are the biggies. Okay. If you have those things defined, what you can do is under Analyze, go to Insight 360. Okay. And under Insight 360, you can go through and analyze some heat and cooling factors. We can analyze the lighting and daylighting. We can analyze the solar kind of radiation capacity. 
or uh, a lot of different surfaces, or how much solar or radiation or insulation is hitting them. We're going to go to lighting for now. I'm going to say, let's choose lighting and do a new analysis. It's going to say, OK, we need to have a location set. I did set the location list. We're in Palo Alto and some rooms. That's all fine. Looks like continue. It's going to present us with a dialogue that looks like this. As it's thinking about daylighting, the way we tend to think about daylighting is relative to the lead criteria. There's two different sets of standards. There's a lead V4, which is a newer set of criteria, which is coming on the scene. There's lead 209, which is still around 2009. Okay, but the V4 is the tougher set of criteria, a little bit harder to meet, but we'll try for that. It's going to basically say, if we cast sun on this building at two different times of year, so September 21st at 9 in the morning and 3 o'clock in the afternoon, we're going to see basically how much of the building is within the allowable threshold of 300 to 3,000 lux. And if it sort of is the correct percentage, and I think it's like 85 or something like that, I always have to remember what it is, you'll uh, sort of pass the credit. So if you say start, what it'll do is it'll do a little bit of uploading. Okay, and it's gonna run in the background. It's basically sending it off to the cloud. Um, if it's having trouble for you, um, you can easily log in to sort of uh, the whole Autodesk suite of services. So I'm logged in as one of Topia. If you have your Autodesk ID, you can log in to enable this. But what it does is it goes off and does some computations. And when it gets done, Actually, I'm just going to have to wait for it to do it. Okay. If you're getting stuck, just let me know. It's going to go cooking away. We're going to get ready to bolt from here in just a few minutes because I know the next class is going to come in in about three or four minutes. Let's see if we can actually get it to run. Oh, actually, hold on, I think that, let me try something again. It's running now, that's fine in terms of what's going on in the cloud. What I want to see is how quick it can be. Oh, there it is, okay, good, it worked. Let me accept it. Then I'll say, let's show me the lighting analysis. And if I switch over to this thing that says lighting analysis, level one, actually you can see right now, but I got zero points, so it looks like I didn't win any uh, prize this time. But you can see a little about sort of what the lighting levels are in the building. So early on, we really haven't done very much with the building yet so far, but what we're able to see is based on this color scale, really where we are in terms of the lighting levels at different points in the geometry, you can sort of see right here in front of the big uh, kind of storefront window. It's very yellow. We have a very high level of lighting right there. It sort of tapers on back. You'll see over here in this upper left-hand corner, it's actually looking pretty dark over there right now. So what that's telling me is that as I start thinking about my design and thinking about the natural daylighting in the building, back over here in the upper left-hand corner, I might need to go through and put some more windows in there. Just kind of let some more lighting in there to even it out. Over here, where it's relatively hot, it has so much lighting, I might need to think about either changing the roof overhang or putting some sort of shading features on the windows to go ahead and cut down on that. We'd like it to sort of be more generally green throughout the entire building, kind of a little more leveled out in terms of what's going on. And that's just like one of the many different types of analysis we'll, doing, we'll do. So as you lay, you know, to wrap up for today, as you lay out your buildings and you sort of get the overall sense of where the, the shape of the building is going, and then start moving to that next level of really thinking about the surfaces of the walls and what they may look like, you know, a really good thing to do is as you start placing windows on different sides of the building, keep on coming back to this lighting analysis to make sure if you're getting good natural daylighting. If we do, you know, we'll not only get sort of lead credits, if you have a building that will be very energy efficient because most of the daylight lighting needs will happen just through the sun as opposed to being in all of uh, artificial energy. Okay? Yes, Henry? So is that uh, one time of the year? Oh, this always does it. It's at September 15th. That's how it evaluates it here. 
and that's just sort of a standard that it uses for the lead daylighting analysis. We can adjust it and do it for other times of the year. Okay, um, it wouldn't be for the lead criteria, but it'd be for our own information. So if you'd like to know what it's like in June or July or in December versus this lead time, we could uh, reset the timing so it's doing it that way too. Okay, but just as a general principle, it's this whole notion of we're gonna keep on designing things, doing a little simulation and modeling to test the results, and based on the results, going back and continuing to redesign. Okay, and that's kind of just the whole principle. We'll keep on following through the class. Okay, great. Let us adjourn for today. Please, if you haven't signed up yet, sign up for a meeting to come talk to us at some point. And uh, we'll just look forward to kind of seeing your first round of buildings. Yes? Um, just a question. Yes? I'm pretty sure it didn't install, so I don't think I know how to install the MSI file. Oh, okay. Or data analysis. Yes. So how do you do that? Okay, what you're going to do is go out to, uh, did you download it? Yes. Okay, just double click on it. Say run. Okay, install now. Let's see what it's doing. I'm never sure which ones are going to ask for the permission or not. If they do ask permission, That's we'll type that in. Yeah, at least on these machines. Uh, on your own machine, you can do whatever. Let's see what's going on. Did it ever do anything? It just sort of sits here. Okay, there you go. So go for the, uh, the top line. Yeah, there you go. Beautiful. In that top secret password you couldn't possibly remember. Okay. Oh, after it installs, you may need to restart Revit to have okay. it show up in the menus. Okay, but I think you're going to do it okay. Okay, thank you. Beautiful. Okay, and then when you're done, it'll show up just under the analyzed action. Um, it it there it is. Okay, so I'm going to say new. Okay, and hopefully it'll kick in. You're never quite sure with these machines. <laughs> I might just restart Revit and kind of like pop sure. back in again. Thanks. No, no worries. Okay.